Well, today's mark is hallmark. The hallmark is a mark of purity, a mark of quality, of consistency. It's a mark that tells us that it's something of value. And when we're looking at what mark we have within our lives to represent Christ, and we look at the mark of hallmark, are we a mark of quality? Does God use us in a way that people will understand that God does great and mighty things through us? And there's a story in the Bible in Acts chapter 16, which is a phenomenal chapter about the Philippian jailer's conversion. But the Philippian jailer's conversion in Acts chapter 16, it doesn't just start with the conversion of the Philippian jailer. Now, when I say Philippian jailer, when I was at Bible college, I just got saved. I went to Bible college, and, and I would always say the Filipino jailer. Because I didn't know there was a difference between the Philippi and the Filipino. So I kept on, and they said, no, 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 it's the Philippian, not the Filipino. And I, I didn't understand that stuff because I didn't really know. But this is the Philippian jailer, not the Filipino jailer. Okay, here's what took place. Paul and Silas came to Philippi. And they were just doing their conversion, their evangelism. They were talking about Christ and starting the early church. And they just led a young lady by the name of Lydia to the Lord. And they, they were walking around sharing their faith with others. And there was a lady there that was demon-possessed. And she was, she was a, 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 a soothsayer. She was a fortune teller. And she would follow Paul and Silas around. And she would say, these guys represent God. These guys are trying to tell you that there's a one and living God. They're telling you things that you really don't want to know. And for day after day after day, this soothsayer, this fortune teller, would follow Paul and Silas around, which, which caused kind of uncomfortableness. I mean, if you ever go someplace and, and they, somebody's always talking about who you are, that you're a Christian and, and you're trying to do this, and they, they kind of got very frustrated with her. And Paul turned to her and said, Get thee out of her, Satan. And instantaneous, instantaneously, the demon left this lady. She was demon-possessed. Now she is free. But the owners of the soothsayer or the demon-possessed woman got very upset at Paul and Silas because their money, how they made their gain, was through fortune-telling. And because they cast the demon out and she didn't have the abilities to do what she did in the past, the owner of the demon-possessed woman got upset at Paul and Silas. So they took Paul and Silas to the magistrate, to the court. And when they took Paul and Silas to the court, they built up a mob, a, a crowd of people that threw accusations against Paul and Silas. And the magistrate told Paul and Silas that you are going to be beaten and you're going to be put into the innermost prison. So here Paul and Silas were doing their thing. They were talking about God. They were sharing their faith with God. They were doing the right thing. Why would God allow Paul and Silas, his servants, to be stripped naked, beaten, shackled, put in the innermost prison for doing nothing wrong. You think about that and you think about our life. You think about, why would all of the stuff that takes place in our life, why doesn't God just come up and say, you know what, you're doing a good thing. I'll just move all the circumstances, negativity uh, away from you, and I'm just going to give you the utopia life. But as we know, that we don't have an utopia life. That there's things that can take place in your life and take place in my life that may be orchestrated by God for a particular purpose. We may not see that purpose, but God always orchestrates around our circumstances to put a smack dab in the middle of God working if we have the purity or the quality mark that God puts in our life. So, if you have the quality, the purity within your life, you've been marked by God, and God is using you in circumstances and situations, here's what takes place. The same story in Acts chapter 16 is exactly what can take place within your life. 
Remember, Paul and Silas, they, they were doing what God asked them to do. They were following after Christ. The mark of a pure God. So we're looking at verses 16 down to 24. And then I want to pick up in verse 25. Because they, Paul and Silas were beaten. I mean, they weren't just spanked. I mean, they, the, the crowd was so mad at them that they were stripped naked in front of everybody and with sticks, they were beaten, they were bruised, they were, they were utterly embarrassed about their situation. So the, 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 the magistrate told the jailer, throw them in the inner prison, deepest, darkest, inner prison. It's not like you go to the Sedgwick County Jail. We're talking in a damp, dark cave, beaten, bloodied, in shackles, could not move. And you think about the circumstances that they are going through. You think about the junk that they had. They were hurting. But yet, in verse 25, it says this. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. After they've been beaten, after they've been embarrassed, they were singing and praying to God. And, and then you see things like this on, in our culture today. I, I, I like Facebook, but sometimes I think some people are very stupid on Facebook. And give me an amen on that. I stubbed my toe today. I think I'm having the worst day in the world, and I don't like my kids. And never, I said, shut up! Unfriend, unfriend, unfriend. I don't care about all your junk going on in your life. Amen? Sometimes, I'm just going to be a preacher. Sometimes it's none of my business what you do, okay? And nobody else cares. Talk about God. Talk about what God is doing within your life. Be a testimony through social media, not negative of God through social media. I think it's very important that we represent God in all aspects of our life. Okay, now I'm done with that part of the sermon. Okay, so I've always wanted to say that for a long time because it's uh, frustrating. I don't know how many times I want to unfriend people just because of that. Okay, let me get my thoughts back together because that, that was not in my notes right there. Okay, and at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Okay, get that? These guys were just beaten. Everybody saw what took place. They couldn't move. They were in shackles. And the prisoners around them were watching. These prisoners were there because they were prisoners. They did something wrong. Paul and Silas were in a kangaroo court, put into prison, the innermost prison, and they were praying and praising God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Very important. Our sphere of influence, those that hear us, those that watch us, they are listening to the very words that we say and the actions that we perform. But God does great things in the midst of adversity. Verse 26, a time of power. I love this. It says, a time of power to release. Suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosened. That was a centralized earthquake at the prison. Let me tell you what that means. God knows everything that you're going through. And there's times where God may supernaturally show up in a way that you cannot comprehend, but God has a plan for what you are going through. What we have to do in the midst of what we go through, sing praises and praise to him. Not because of the circumstances. Not thank God for all the junk that's going in my life. I want to praise God for who he is, what he's done for me. And if I praise God for who he is and what he's done for me, then in the midst of my circumstance, God will show up. God wants us to praise him and pray to him all the time because of what he has done for us, because when we praise and pray he, to him in the midst of our circumstances, we don't focus on our circumstances. We start focusing on him through our circumstances. Our lens of our life may change. 
because we are in a different position within our life. But suddenly there was a great earthquake, and it released not only Paul and Silas, but it released all the prisoners' chains. Sometimes God works through you to other people because of the way that we look at God, the way that we praise God, the way that we pray to God, the way that we communicate to God. It can impact other people's lives. And then the verses 27 and 28. And the keeper of the prison, awakening from his seat, saw the prison doors were open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword, and was about to kill himself. But Paul called with loud voice, saying, Do yourself no harm, for we are here. Let's get the picture now. The, the, the jail keeper. He was in charge of all the prisoners. He just saw the crowd beat Paul and Silas. He was just charged by the magistrate to keep these guys in prison. To beat them. To shackle. He didn't have any mercy for these guys. He lived probably next door, and his job was to make sure their life was miserable. Not to make them comfortable, but to make their life miserable. And he knew that if the magistrate threw them in jail for nothing, and then these guys released, that he knew his life would be taking place of their life. And he would either be put to death or be put into chains. And he knew that. He knew that from the past, from the past jailers. And he looked at that and he said, you know what? I would rather be dead than to be put in their shackles. So he took his sword, thinking, I am going to rather kill myself than to be humiliated as a Roman soldier to be put into prison. So he was about ready to kill himself. Then Paul said, stop. Don't do that. We're still here. Now, you're thinking, or I was thinking, number one, an earthquake that opened the prison doors, that took the shackles off the prisoners. That's amazing. But you know what's even more amazing? All the prisoners stayed in prison. They could have walked away. But God had a plan. All of this stuff was orchestrated for a reason. And the reason was the church, the early church. Because Paul and Silas was in that predicament for this particular purpose. And the Philippian jailer said to him, What must I do to be saved? When you get to the point where you have no hope, when you don't know what's taking place, when God starts orchestrating things within your life and you have no idea what's going on and you fall on your face before God and you say, God, I need your help. In all of our circumstances, that is the biggest, most important need within our life to say, Lord, I need you. You don't care about image. You don't care about position. You care about God supernaturally showing up in your life and doing something miraculous. And Paul and Silas were put in this particular position with the beatings, with the shackles, with the embarrassment to lead this man and his family to God. God, it doesn't make sense. Why would I have to go through all of this stuff? Why would I have to be beaten? Why would I have to be embarrassed for this guy? Because we have no idea what God is going to do through the influence that you have and through the people around you. What we have to be is we have to be the vehicle. We have to be the conduit to say, Lord, I'm yours. Whatever you want me to do or wherever you want me to go, even the junk that I have to go through within my life, if that is your will, Lord, I want to be faithful to do what you want me to do. But sometimes in our culture today, we hear and we think that Christianity will be very comfortable. We will be successful. We will not be hurt. And God will come down and he'll give us everything that we want if we fall on our knees before God and say, Lord, I was good this week. I want you to do this. And we give God the gigantic list of everything that we want. And we think that we're not a good Christian 
if God doesn't supernaturally bless us in every area of our life. Well, you know what the stamp or the mark of purity is? Is that you and I would be faithful in our adversity, through our circumstances, that in the midst of all of our chaos, God will say, I can still trust you. I can still use you. I can still maneuver my life through you. And the hardest, most difficult times within your life, I'm going to use your life to bring glory and honor to me. And that's exactly what Paul and Silas did to this Philippian jailer. They were beaten. The, the Philippian jailer thought he was going to die. He said, what must I do to be saved? And let's look at verse 31. Um, let's look at verses 29 through 31. And then he called for a light and ran in and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. I like these words, trembling. He was scared to death. He fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou will be saved, and your household. Now, just because the Philippian jailer got saved doesn't mean his household was saved. It means because God saves you, your influence upon your family should allow them to see Jesus within you so that you can reproduce your life in them. We had a funeral here uh, uh, Thursday, I think it was, and uh, uh, it, it was for a, a lady that was big in the Indian uh, heritage. And we had the funeral here, and then we went down to Adarko. I think it's Adarko. Did I say that right? Anadarko. It, it very dark. I mean, it's, it's, it's way down in the middle of Oklahoma, which is not even really a state. I mean, it's way down there. And, I mean, it's, it's between Texas and Kansas, and God had to put something in there. So he put Oklahoma in there. Uh, Oklahoma beat KU yesterday, so it's really not a really good, good place to be at in your life. But anyway, we went down to, to this town, and the, um, one of the um, Kiowa chiefs, came down and did a couple songs in the Kiowa language. And he started talking a little bit. And he said this, which, which was neat. I was the preacher, and I got to share about Jesus and about love and, and what God has done for salvation. And if we have faith in Christ, we're going to see Betty again. And I shared the simple plan of salvation. And he came up after he sang a couple songs, and he said this, which sent chills up my spine. Now, you got to remember, this was in an Indian, uh, Indian cemetery, and it was... It, it was just very uh, Indian, okay? So <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. But here is what he said. He said, many, many, many years ago, a missionary came to my people, and he shared with my people the love and the forgiveness of Jesus. And because my people believed in Jesus, my people have a hope of eternity. Because my people would never be able to go to heaven if a missionary didn't share Jesus to us. I thought, I'm supposed to be the preacher here. But he shared exactly what we need to hear. That if Jesus is not the Lord of our life, we do not have hope for eternity. So when Jesus impacted these people's lives through the love of God, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved and your household. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. And your household. The heritage that we bring. So when we become a faithful follower of Christ, we do not get a rubber stamp of saying, okay, I'm saved, my family is saved, my great-grandkids are faith, saved. Every person Every person has to come to their own realization and believe that Jesus Christ is their Lord, not because dad is saved, not because mom is saved, it's because they have to have a faith in Jesus Christ. That's why we do, at, at Glenville, we don't do infant baptisms. Because we can't give a false security of salvation to a child. 
What we do is we do a dedication. We dedicate this child to the Lord so they will see Christ at an early age. But we can't dedicate and baptize a child into Christ because every person has to come to faith for themselves in Jesus Christ. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So it's very important that we understand. So the restraints are dropped, and then he came to redeem. In verse 32, Then they spoke the word of the Lord to them and to all who were in his house. Not just to the jailer. They spoke the word to them and all that was in their house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately... He and his family were baptized. Next week, we're talking about watermark. A watermark. What is baptism all about? Why do we baptize? What's the purpose of baptism? It's a watermark that every person that has faith in Christ is an obedient step of faith to say, you know what? I'm a follower of Christ, and I'm not ashamed to proclaim the message of Christ, and my life is radically changed and I have a mark within my life to say I've been saved and I have followed Jesus Christ in baptism. So I have a mark within my life that I am a proclaimer of the message of Jesus Christ because of my life. So their entire house was baptized. Now when he had brought them into the house, he set food before them and he rejoiced, having believed God with his whole household. He believed in God with his whole household. Because of an event... Because of the Philippian jailer being beside the jail, God showed up in a miraculous way. Paul and Silas was willing to go through hell in order for one man and one family to come to know Jesus Christ. His entire household was saved, brought into the church. Now the church is beginning to run and thrive in Philippi. Why? It's because Paul and Silas had the mark of purity, of heritage within their life, that they did not care what they went through. They cared that God was using them. So in our circumstances in life, whatever we go through, if we are faithful and we're following after God, and God puts a radical turn within your life, I mean a radical. Can you still praise God? When you get that phone call in the middle of the night or when you go to the doctor's visit and you get the terrible news, when somebody within your family is thrown in jail, you're going through a divorce, can you still praise God? Now, it may be circumstances of your calling or your doing, but God still loves you. He unconditionally loves you. And God can use your circumstance and your situation better than you can. But can you, in the darkest part of the night, the midnight hour, when everybody else is asleep and you have been beaten and bruised and embarrassed, and you feel like there's no hope, can you pray unto God? And can you sing praises to Him? When naturally the first thing I'd want to do is curse, be upset, Wonder why I have to go through this. Why am I doing all this? But in the midst of the jail cell, in the midst of being beaten, in the midst of being bruised, in the midst of being handcuffed by your feet and your hands, in the embarrassment of being thrown in jail, in the darkest of nights, they sing praises and prayers. And all around them heard their words. What a wonderful testimony that when nothing else makes sense in your life and you're not praising God because of you, you're praising God because of Him. You can thank God for what He's done within your life to know that this is junk that I'm going through, but I have somebody that's going to hold me through the junk. I have somebody that's going to take care of me in the midst of my life, in the midst of my failures, in the midst of my pains. I know that God is going to be with me. And we all have things within our life. We all have circumstances that we wonder why. We wonder why I have to go through this. We wonder what happened within my life. Did I do something wrong? And I want to say that God can use whatever 
you go through. Whatever your life is, God has a supernatural plan, an earthquake to say, to shake you to your core, to allow you to worship His name, to allow your influence to bring glory to Him. And when you bring glory to Him, and the circumstances people hear, here's what takes place. And I love this last part. It, it's, a, it's a time where God restores. It's a time where when you go through your life and you go through junk and you feel embarrassed, you feel like God is not with you, and then God supernaturally shows up. Time after time after time, God does great things. Now let's look at verse 35 through 40. And when it was day, the magistrate sent his offer saying, let those men go. In other words, they saw the power of God. And the magistrate, they just threw them into jail. The next morning, said, get those guys out of here. We don't really know what's taking place, but we know that we don't want to mess with these guys. So the innkeeper of the prison reported these words to Paul saying, the magistrates have sent to let you go. Now, therefore, depart and go in peace. In other words, they just said, just get out of town. Just act like it didn't take place. Just, just hide what God is doing within your life. But remember, they came into Philippi for a reason, to share the message of Jesus Christ. They just witnessed God do a miraculous work within their life, even in the midst of their pain. God showed up. Now, they're saying, just leave. Just shh, don't tell anybody what God has done. Just leave. But Paul said to them, they have beaten us openly, uncondemned Romans, which means if you're a Roman citizen, by law, they could not have been beaten or touched. Now, Paul could have said, I'm a Roman. But God told Paul supernaturally, don't, don't proclaim that. I have a plan for you. I have a plan through you. But now Paul is saying, I am a Roman. I am not going to let you beat me. I am not going to let you do this quietly because I have a plan. And I want to tell you what that plan is here in a second. And I have thrown us into prison. And now they do this out secretly? No way. Let them come to themselves and get us out. And the officers told these words to the magistrates. And they were afraid. Then they heard that they were Romans. Then they came and pleaded with them and brought them out. And asked them to depart from the city. And I love what Paul did in verse 40. So they went out of prison and entered into the house of Lydia, the lady that just got saved earlier in the chapter. And when they had seen the brethren, they encouraged them and departed. What is those last five verses about? Paul knew that if they were believers and they were starting a church in Philippi, and Paul and Silas that started the church could be thrown into prison, beaten, and scourged, they would do the same thing with the believers that started that early church. But Paul knew that I'm not going to let them do that to me. I'm not going to let them do that to my fellow believers in Christ that's starting this church. I am going to let them know that they did something wrong to me and I represent God. And if they, it's called Christian blackmail. If they do that to me, they would do that to them. And I'm a Roman citizen. Basically he's saying, leave my people alone because I represent God. And if God can do that through me and for me, he will do that for them to you. So it's an opportunity for God to work with an early church, to have circumstances and chaos that were outside of Paul and Silas's control. But Paul and Silas, they were faithful. They were faithful to God in the midst of their circumstances. And the darkest of night, when all of the world was against them, they felt like there was no hope. They were chained, beaten, and scourged. God shows up. And you know when God shows up? Just in time. Just in time. When you wonder what's going to take place tomorrow, when you wonder what I'm going to do, God shows up. God shows up in a miraculous way, and when God shows up, the whole world sees. Your family sees. 
And God uses your influence to change people's lives. The question is said, what must I do to be saved? Paul and Silas together, they say, you just have to believe in Jesus. Believe in what God can do through you. Believe that God loves you. And because of Paul and Silas' faithfulness to God through the midst of their adversity, the Philippian jailer and his family heard about Jesus, believed in Christ, were saved and baptized. Man, that's a lot of stuff to go through for one family. But if that's what God has called you to do, to go through all this stuff to get saved, would you do it? Would you do it? I want to conclude with a, with a story. And many of you that have been to this church for years have heard this story before. But it's a story that I believe was a point in my life and a point in my family's life that radically changed the direction of my family. My brother was murdered in Manhattan, and uh, uh, they asked me to do the funeral. So I stood up in front of my family around a graveside with my brother. That was the best man in our wedding. Um, and I shared the plan of salvation, a simple plan of salvation, to my family and to all the friends. And at that point, I was the only Christian within the family. And they looked at that, and they thought I was the crazy, psycho, Christian preacher dude that I shared about Jesus. And from that issue through a series of events, my nieces got saved, my sister got saved, my parents got saved, and I firmly believe that God allows things to take place. And even though the things that take place, we hate, we despise, but God uses. And God puts opportunities in front of us in the midst of our worst disasters in order to bring glory to his name. So when you look at your junk, your stuff within your life, and you say, what in the world am I going to do? I tell you this. I believe at that point within my life that was the lowest I ever felt. But at that point, when I felt like I was the lowest and I didn't know what to do, God, out of that, did a miraculous work. My dad just passed away a few years ago, and I can stand at his funeral, and I can say because he had faith in Jesus Christ, my father is in heaven. Because junk took place, the circumstance happened, and Jesus was glorified, and he received Jesus as Lord and Savior. Do I like what took place? No. But I love what God did through what took place. And in your life, in the midst of your disaster, in the midst of your prison, in the midst of your earthquake, can you give praise and can you give glory to God? Because if you can, you're going to see God do great things through you because you've got the mark of God, the quality that God says, I can trust you. I put my stamp of approval on you. And I'm going to allow you to go through junk to bring glory to me so I can use your life as a conduit, as a vehicle, as a way to share the love and the forgiveness of Christ. But see, it has to be from your perspective. Here's the perspective. Is what you're going through yours? Or is what you're going through God's? If what you're going through is mine, I'm going to deal with it. It's my junk. Then you're going to deal with it all by yourself. 
But if you're going to look at all your junk that you're going through as God's, that God is moving me and making me to a per point that he can be used in me and I can bring glory to his name and I can sing praises and pray to him in the midst of the darkest hour, then God is going to use your junk to bring glory to him. So my challenge is very simple. The stuff, the prison, the chains, the scars. Are you going to keep them for yourself? Or are you going to allow the junk, your pain, to be glorified, to sing praises and prayer to God so the prisoners and the people around you will see that who you represent is God? What is it? that God is trying to do? What is it that God is trying to orchestrate within your life that brings glory to Him? The first thing that you must do is you must understand that God has a plan. God has a plan for your life. And God is going to use you in a miraculous way if you give Him your life. Not only your salvation. We're talking your everyday junk. Circumstances. Problems give them to him and if you give him your life an earthquake can show up your chains can be broken your life can be refreshed and God can use you like you could not even imagine if you give him your life let's go to Lord in prayer ask Greg to come forward we're going to sing a song of invitation here in a second but if you are going through issues, first you talk to God. And you ask God what he's wanting to do within your life. And then allow God to change you by giving him all of your life. If you have an issue that you're going through, maybe you, your wife, or your husband, or your kids, you have an issue that you don't want to deal with but you know that you can't deal with it alone. I want to challenge you. Give it to God. Let Him show up and change the outcome. But as long as you hold that into yourself, there will never be a change. You'll go through life repeating the same scenario over and over and over again, and there will not be any joy and happiness within your life. If you're not happy where you are spiritually, if you're not happy with the way your life is going, you're not happy with, a, with an addiction, you got junk going on in your life, give it to God. Let God do what God can only do. Change your direction. Give your stuff a purpose to help others in their need. And God will do that and it'll give you purpose within your life. Will you all please stand? Let me have